Well, good morning, Northland family. Are you excited to be here today? Best day of the week. There's no better place to be than in God's house with God's people, just worshiping our King Jesus. Amen. Come on, let's give him some praise. Has he been good to you? We sang the words. Has he been good to you? Thank you, Jesus. Well, if we haven't met yet, my name is Dan Young, and uh, I joined the staff along with my family, my wife, and three kids. Really not kids anymore. They're, they're adult kids. I'm still getting used to that. It's a little bit different. Uh, but we joined the staff here at Northland uh, just during the summer as the executive pastor of Next Gen, and we oversee our children's ministry. And I just want to, before I even start, just say thank you to Northland. You are an incredible community of believers. You know, when, when friends or family from around the country say, well, how's your transition been to Northland? Here's what I say. Northland is the most authentic group of Jesus followers that I've ever been part of. So thank you for loving my family so well and for adopting us into the Northland family. We are just thrilled to be part of this team. Well, we're gonna continue in uh, the book of Acts this morning. Last week, Pastor Josh did an incredible job in Acts chapter 17. And I'll tell you, he's um, not an easy act to follow. And then if you were here Friday night, Tim Hawkins was here. Was anyone here for Tim Hawkins? Yeah, well, welcome to Bass Pro Shops. If you were here, you'll get that. If you weren't here, you'll just need to ask someone that's laughing. But Tim's not an easy act to follow either. Hey, can we do this? Can we all stand up together? And let's just read God's word. We're in Acts chapter 18. And let's read the word together. Here's what it says. Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all of the Jews from Rome. Hey, I just want you to put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to that later. I have a theory on that, okay? I can't say that it's, it's factual, but I got theory. I think it's pretty cool. We're gonna tie it in, okay? So they left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all the Jews from Rome, and Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers just as he was. Verse four, each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike, and after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all of his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and they insulted him, Paul shook the dust off from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go and preach to the Gentiles. Verse seven says this, then he left and went to the home of Titus Justus, a Gentile who worshiped God and lived next door to the synagogue. He kind of went door to door at that point. And he lived uh, at Cyprus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. And many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. Verse nine says this, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack and harm you. For many people in the city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word we thank you that it is a lamp unto our feet, that it is a light unto our path, that it leads us and it guides us in daily living. We thank you for your son Jesus who gave it all to break the barrier that keeps us from you, the barrier of sin. So we say today, come Holy Spirit, be in this place as we learn from your word. Open our hearts, open our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, last week what we saw in Acts chapter 17 was that Paul was in Athens. And Pastor Josh did such a great job walking us through Athens a little bit. And we, we, we learned quickly that Athens was a place of intellectual thinking, great philosophers. It was the creative minds of the day. It was what we refer to as Harvard of the time. And we also see that in Athens, there was a great deal of idolatry and, uh, and, and worship to, to false gods. We see there that Paul really left feeling discouraged. Maybe he felt like his ministry didn't connect, it wasn't seeing the, the fruit that he wanted, but when he left, he was pretty discouraged. And when he showed up in Corinth, where he was going next, where we're jumping into today, we see that Paul says himself, I'm showing up in my own weakness. He was alone at that point. We saw later that, that Silas came down to join him. We know that, that Barnabas had left and went off with John Mark, which looked like maybe there was a, a, a conflict there, but I also think that that was, that was God's divine plan because it was a divide and conquer, right? So the gospel got to go further than it did, maybe if they traveled together. But Paul, I believe at this point was discouraged. And you can say, well, Pastor Nan, how, how, do you, how do you know that? Let me pull Pastor Josh right here. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, I've been waiting all week to do that. All right, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Here's what Paul says as he's getting into Corinthians, but he's writing this letter uh, to the Corinthians when he was in Ephesians, uh, Ephesus. And it says this, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom. That's how he would went to Athens, right? With eloquence and human wisdom trying to persuade philosophically the minds of the day. But he says is, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Here it is. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with the wise and, and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Come on. So that you and your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. You know, when we look at the book of Acts, it's easy to look at the character and the story that we're learning about. So what we see in the gospel so clearly is that, that God had a plan of redemption for mankind. We know that humanity had a fall back in the book of Genesis in the garden when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, introducing sin into the world. The book of Romans says this, that for the wages of sin, the, pun the price, the punishment, the payment of that sin is death. Aren't you glad there's not a period right there? Because I know I'm a sinner. And if the payment and punishment for my sin is death, then I'm not only a sinner, but I'm a goner, right? There's a comma instead of a period that says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Jesus came to pay that punishment for our sin. He died on a cross. He was buried three days in a grave until he rose again showing his glorious power over sin, death, sickness, and the grave. And today he sits at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for each and every one of us. And yeah, we can, we can love the Lord a little bit this morning. And that's where the book of Acts picks up because then Jesus, before he goes back to heaven, says back to heaven, he says, now I want you to wait. And I want you to gather and you're gonna pray. And I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit's power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And what we see in the book of Acts is not just Paul's story, but in Acts 2, we see Peter's story. We see, in Acts 7, we see Stephen's story. We see Tabitha's story. You know, Tabitha also went by the name Dorcas. That's a lot of fun as a kid's pastor to preach. Just, 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 that's fun right there. We also see Philip and, and the Ethiopian. We see Paul. We see uh, Barnabas. There, there's so many people in this story. The people that uh, Luke's writing about in the story are not the main characters of Acts. 
The main character of Acts is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to empower his church, to live within us, to fill us with his power so that we can go out and be a witness to the world of the goodness of God. And we see people through the book of Acts that are doing just that. So today we're really talking about, a great title for the book of Acts would be the Acts of the Holy Spirit working through the life of the apostles. So we see that Paul leaves Athens and he makes his way over to Corinth. So I'm gonna give you a lot of context on Corinth today. It's gonna be a lot of, of history because I want to put a filter in place for us that when we read the word uh, next, when you, when you maybe go home and you start to study through First and Second Corinthians, you can have this imagery of what Paul had seen, had heard, had experienced and the people that he was communicating with. Does that, does that sound fair? Can we do that this morning? So Paul would have showed up in Corinth around 51 AD. So that, that's just shy of 20 years after the resurrection. So really not a long time after Christ was crucified, died, buried, and resurrected. Now, uh, Paul shows up on the scene in Corinth. There is an estimated about 400,000 people living in Corinth at the time. Now, most of the people that, when Corinth was established by the Romans, what they did was they took slaves and freed slaves and just kind of shifted and put them in Corinth. So initially, Corinth was made up of slaves and free slaves, okay? So it was back in, in 51 AD. It was about five times larger than Athens, one of the most important and strategic cities in its time. So I'm gonna go over some of the strengths and potential weaknesses, as you'll see, of Corinth, okay? So the first strength in Corinth is it had a setting for an ideal defense. So every city needs to have a good defense system in case foreign nations are gonna come and invade to try to occupy that land. So one of the things that was a strength for Corinth, we see right here this hill or this mountain, that's called the Acro Corinth. okay? So that gave the people of Corinth the high ground in case an invading army was gonna make their way to Corinth to try to overtake the city. So we know as a military strategy, whenever you have the high ground, you, you, you've got a good vantage point, right? You, you, you can see what's going on down. You can protect yourself. So, so Corinth was a strength to have that. They also had these tunnels. They had these grates that they can pick up in the ground. They can drop down and they can travel underground and go out of Corinth so that they can pop up some uh, ways away and I just wonder when they did that, if like when a, when a Corinthian popped up, if that meant like six more weeks of winter. Uh, I'm a kid's pastor, folks. You might get this all morning. So, so they would, they'd be able to, to pop in this grate, go underground, come up, grab supplies, go back down and come in. So they'd be able to go around the enemy that was trying to attack the city. Also, they had great water supply, which was super important. So, you know, in that, in that region, you know, it's very dry, very uh, mountainous, very rocky. But in Corinth, not only did they have a, a water spring, but they had about 300 cisterns, which are large vessels to collect water and rainwater. So, so they, they had a good, strong defense, okay? Secondly, their geography was a strength to uh, Corinth. So let's talk about the geography just a little bit. I put a little pin on there. I don't know if you can see it. Is it big enough for you? That, that, that's right about where Corinth would be, okay? So Corinth sat on this piece of land called an isthmus. Isthmus. Not quite as fun as Dorcas, but still a good word. So this little piece of land here is called an isthmus. And what an isthmus is, it's a small piece of land that connects two larger pieces of land. So we see upper Greece and lower Greece would have been connected by that small piece of land. That was about 3.7 miles across. So let's zoom out a little. Let me tell you why that was important. 
Because back in the day, there was no Amazon Prime. And if you wanted to get a package shipped to you, it wasn't coming in two days like it is today. But if you started over here in Macedonia, Thessalonica, Berea, anywhere in here, even Asia, you would have to sail down and around Archaea and then back up to get to Italy where Rome is. That adds from Corinth and around about 200 miles onto the sailor's journey. Now, if you look in there, what do you notice like right here? There's just a lot of rocks. The debris was difficult. It was, it was a very dangerous place. It was very stormy, lots of weather, lots of waves, wind. In fact, it was so dangerous to sail around that point that it was said any sailor who attempts to make that trip twice will never see home again. That's how dangerous the sea was. So it was so much easier for the people to do this. They would take their, their ships. We're going to go back to the isthmus. There we go. We're going to go back here. And so what they would do, they made a road that went across. Today, there's a canal there, but uh, at that time, they didn't have the, the technology to put a canal there. So they made a road at this isthmus. And on the road, they would take large uh, logs and use them as rollers. So a ship would come into port on this side, and it would be offloaded, most likely by slaves, placed all the cargo placed on the rollers and pushed across the 3.7 miles to a boat waiting on the other side so that they can sail to Rome. Coming back from Rome, they would do the same thing. They would come to this side, they would push the cargo across and it would sail away. Got it? Are you guys tracking with me so far? So that was important to Corinth because of a few reasons. It brought uh, all the trade right through. They became a crossroads, if you will, to the world. If you were gonna move any cargo or goods to that region, you had to go right through Corinth. So Corinth was smart about it. There was taxation, there was housing for the sailors, there was entertainment, there was all these things that they were able to, to really build wealth as a, as a city. So it was really strategic geographically. Okay? It was also uh, strength because it was a center for trade and manufacturing. Has anyone ever heard of Corinthian bronze? Corinthian bronze at the time was the finest bronze that could be produced. It's been found all throughout that region. They had a way of taking, I believe it was like a tin, and mixing it with the bronze, and by the time they were done, it looked as pure as gold. It was just a phenomenal product. And what we see here is you can see the, the, the streets. You can almost see these little uh, rectangles. They were lined with shops. So whenever people came in, whether they were sailing in or coming in for other uh, events, there was plenty of shopping that was to be had. So lots of, you know, think Fifth Avenue in New York City. The people would come through and there's lots of, lots of uh, shopping that would happen there, Okay. And then the, uh, the next strength is they had something called the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games was only second to the Olympics. Folks, it was a big, big deal. Now, when Paul showed up in Corinth, we already talked about he was feeling weak, maybe downcast. And, and, and going into a, a brand new city, he was going alone. And I would imagine that that would feel pretty overwhelming. Would you not? I would think that it would. But let me say this, where God guides, God provides. So he may have went into the city with very little in his pockets and no friends around him, but it didn't stay that way for long. We know that, that he met some friends there. He met Aquila and Priscilla, who were both tent makers. And think about this. If people from all around the world were to come into Corinth for the Isthmian Games, which really was about five kilometers outside of Corinth, those people need a place to sleep at night, don't they? That's a pretty good business for a tent maker. You see how that ties together? 
So Paul was able to sustain himself financially in his work of the ministry because God provided an opportunity for him to use the skill set that he's developed in a place where he can prosper. You guys tracking with me? All right, so there's the Isthmian Games. And there's something um, I want to I flip over to Hebrews chapter 12 real fast, uh, one through three. And here's what the writer says, and I believe that he was thinking about maybe the Isthmian Games, could be Olympics, but it was definitely games like it. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. See, what would happen in these races, it wasn't like it is today where they would run in an oval track. It was a little bit more like middle school where they set up a, a pole at the end. I don't know if you guys did this as a kid. I know I did. And we would line up and you would fix your eyes on that pole. And when it gate dropped, you would dart as fast as you can around that pole, right? And right back to the starting line. But look what it says here. The passion that they did it in. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. So the athletes were so serious about winning these games that they would throw off anything that hinders or entangles. Okay? There were no dry fit shirts. There were no moisture wicking shorts. They weren't wearing Nikes, right? Are you tracking with me? They didn't want anything to hinder their race. Their eyes were set. They ran completely naked. Here, I got a picture, let me show you. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Hey, whatever happened to Pastor Dan? We never seen him after that week. Put some naked Corinthians up on us. All right, so. They were serious. They wanted to win. And the last thing, and this uh, really where it starts to shift from being a strength to maybe a weakness. And it was a destination for religious pilgrims. So much like what we saw in Athens, Corinth was filled of, with idolatry. They said there was uh, around 36 different gods that were worshiped continually in Corinth, okay? So 30, So what we're seeing here is, is one of the temples that was constructed as a place of worship for one of the gods in Corinth. There were 36 different gods. That would be confusing. But remember the Acro-Corinth behind it? We're gonna switch that to the, the photo of the Acro-Corinth again. If you look up top, you can see there's some some buildings up there. That is also a temple on top of the Acrocorinth. That temple was a temple to Aphrodite. Has anybody ever heard of Aphrodite? So Aphrodite would have been the goddess really of lust, immoral pleasure, sexual immorality. And every day, every single day, over a thousand temple prostitutes, both men and women, would descend from the temple of Aphrodite into the city of Corinth. And they would offer their services for free if for a donation to the goddess Aphrodite. So start to put this together, friends. You've got all these sailors that are coming in with their trades, coming right through Corinth, and every day there's a thousand temple prostitutes coming down into the city to worship Aphrodite the way that they see fit. And let me pause here and say this, that it is never a good idea when we mix immorality with worship. Let me say that again. It's never a good idea when we, miss, when we mix immorality with worship. Well, what do you mean by that? 
I'm just gonna say this. There are a lot of people today that wanna live particular lifestyles, live a certain way, that will look into God's word, will twist scripture around to try to fit it into a place where they can say, okay, I can justify what I'm doing. It's never, ever a good idea. Let's just, let's just stick with God's word, amen? Let's just do it his way. So it was a destination for religious pilgrims. You know, the Greeks, they loved their theater. They loved to put on plays, and they had uh, uh, amphitheaters everywhere. There's actually an amphitheater in Corinth uh, today, so you can see the, the ruins there. And the amphitheater, believe it or not, has not been excavated yet. So it's going, to be, it's going to be really neat when it is. So you can go to Corinth today and you can see uh, in the ground buried, you can start to see the shape and the, and the seats of this, this amphitheater. Well, any time that there was a, a, an actor in the play that was a Corinthian, was from Corinth, that person in the play was always represented by a drunk. Someone who stumbled around, who lived immorally, who just did their own thing, and that was, a, there's actually a, a saying, and it was to Corinthianize someone. I think that means you're gonna pull them to the dark side, right? It's probably not where we wanna go with uh, leading people, right? But they wanted to pull people to make them Corinthianized. Or if you went to Corinth, you were Corinthianized. It's kind of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth. So that is the setting that Paul was walking into. And don't forget, he was without his friends, his pockets were light, and he's just weak from uh, the experience that he had in Athens. You know, I, when, I, when I look through the Bible, I can't find a book of Athens, you guys see a book of Athens, All right? So, so when Paul left, he really wasn't even writing back to anybody to encourage them or to build up their faith because I, it, just, it just didn't go the way that he wanted. It just wasn't the most successful mission. And that's okay. That happens to all of us. So now Paul is moving into to Corinth and where God guides, God provides. So we see in verses one through three of chapter 18, that Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla who are tent makers just like he is. It is so important that we have friends, friends in life, people that, that we can count on, we can be accountable to, that'll walk us through tough times, that we can help walk them through tough times to do life together. Friends, I don't know what some people do without the church. I am so thankful for the church and that every low in my life, there were people that would come surround and encourage and support me. And I hope that you felt that in the church as well. I want to tell you a quick story from, from the first church that, that my wife and I were a part of. We were on staff. It was back in New Jersey. And we were fresh out of Bible school. We were in our, in our 20s at the time. Um, not in my 20s anymore, so that was a long time ago. And... Uh, in this particular church, we lived in a parsonage. So a parsonage is just a house that is owned by the church that, that the, the pastor or the staff uh, can live in. So it was a, it was a four-family house. It was in Patterson, New Jersey. It was a lot of fun. And, and the bottom floor was a basement apartment. It was a little bit creepy. And that's where Pastor Steve lived. And then the next floor up would have been a nice two-bedroom apartment. And that's where our youth pastors, Jim and Annette, lived. Jennifer and I lived up in one apartment. Then our worship pastors lived across the hall from us. We're all about the same age, all about the same stage of life. And what just happened naturally is just about every day, we would all gather together for dinner. We'd have dinner together. We'd play some video games and, and just enjoy being with each other. But we would laugh until our sides split. Like, I can probably spend all day just telling stories of, of just the, the laughter that we had. I, yeah, when, when Jim left, Jim's still today, 20 years later, uh, one of my best friends on the planet. When he left and he went to another church, I would, I would prank phone call the secretary every day and ask if he's still in the state because he's not allowed to leave the state. And I would come up with all these crazy scenarios where, where his new team is like, um, 
what, what's going on? And he's just like, listen, I've got this friend named Dan, and you just, he, he can't, he's gonna do this. You know, but we laughed, and we laughed, and we laughed. And why is that important? Because there was a day that came in that church where I get a phone call, and I said, Dan, there's been an accident. We need you to get to the hospital quickly. That's just something you never want to hear when you're, when you're in ministry. So I get to the hospital, and I walk into a room with two parents who just unexpectedly and very tragically lost their seven-year-old son. And it was the first time that these folks had seen their son laying there lifeless. And even at age 50, I'm not equipped for that. I was far less equipped in my 20s. It was a tough day, not just for me, but definitely for that family. So I get to be there and, and try, to, try to muster up the right words to speak to this family in their time of such tremendous loss. But here's what happens. You want know, to see a little bit behind the curtain? I go home that night, and guess what I do? I bawl my eyes out for days. But I was so thankful that I had friends in my life that would come around and support and encourage and speak faith into and, and were able to then rise, you know, pick myself up by my bootstraps and, and walk with that family through their darkest day. I wish I could say today that, that dark days are never going to come, that life's going to be easy, that it's all smooth sailing when we have Jesus in your life, but friends, that's just not the, that's not, that's not the case. So we are going to need each other. We're going to need our friends as we get through challenging moments. Got it? You guys still with me? Can you blink two or three times so I know you're there? <laughs> all right. Well, he didn't only, oh, let, me, let, me, let me say this about, about Priscilla and Aquila as well. So it's interesting to me, we're going to put a different map up here. It's interesting to me that the Bible says in, here in Acts 18 that they're coming down from Rome, okay? So just to give you a little lay of the land here, here's Jerusalem down here. We know that they were Jews. They were uh, at one point in Jerusalem. So we've got Damascus where Paul would have had his uh, experience over here somewhere. It's not listed. would have been uh, uh, Tharsis, we got Ephesus over here, Corinth, but Rome is way over here. So if we're in 51 AD, less than 20 years later, let me, let me just say this. Paul didn't even get to Rome in his missionary journeys until about 58 AD, which means that the missionary aspect of the gospel hasn't even traveled to Rome yet. We're about seven years too early. But there it says that, that Aquila and Priscilla come from Rome, and we see that, that the Caesar had thrown all of the Jews out of Rome. Well, how did these Christians get to Rome if the gospel hasn't traveled there yet? Have you ever asked yourself that? So if there were enough Christians living in a Roman time to cause a disturbance where the government had to throw them out, it just is worth asking the question, how did they get there so far away in such a short time since the death and resurrection of Jesus, especially if the missionaries haven't even gotten there yet? Remember I told you earlier I had a theory I wanted to bounce past you? Are you ready? So how did Christians get way out there? Pentecost. Pentecost. So what we know about Pentecost is this, that just 50 days after Jesus ascended, that the Holy Spirit was going to change addresses for one last time. Well, what do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble tomorrow. What do I mean by that? So, so, we know that this was during one of the pilgrimage festivals. So Jews from all of the known world would have traveled to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of Sukkot, which is also called Passover, I mean Pentecost, which um, is, so everyone would have been there. And then we see the Holy Spirit rise up from behind the, the, the Holy of Holies in tongues of fire, and now shift and fall on the believers of the church. See, at one point, 
The Holy Spirit lived in a tabernacle, right? In the Old Testament and was moved around place to place. That's where the presence of God lived. I think of it like this. The heavens are his throne and the earth was his footstool. Think of him extending himself into the, the, the tabernacle. And in the New Testament, we see that tabernacle, those tents were made a permanent home and the presence of God dwelt in the temple behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. We know that on the day that Jesus was crucified, that that veil was torn in half. And then on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes up out of there. Never again to live in a tent, never to, again to live in a place made of stone, but now lives within you and I. The Holy Spirit, the same Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the grave lives within each and every one of us. That should be something to be excited about. So I think more than just being uh, tent maker friends, which was important, I think they found some Holy Ghost filled evangelists that were ready to change the world and go into the, to the ends of the earth with the gospel. And I think that's where their friendship was forged more than anything else. We need some friends in our life that are willing to lay it all down for the gospel. Number three is Paul also had not only some, some friends, but he had some foes. He had some enemies in Corinth as well. We see right here that when he went into the synagogues in um, verse 6, 12, 13, 17, that the way that the synagogue's leaders treated Paul, he was abused, he was arrested, he was accused. He wasn't treated well. His word was not taken to heart. And then they bring him before the Roman governor, Gallio, and they charge Paul with blasphemy, but Gallio refuses to try that case. You know, we can look at those as a setback, right? It could, Paul could have looked at it as when, when, he, when he went to the synagogue to preach Jesus in a place that needed to hear about Jesus, when he was met with opposition, we could easily say, oh man, looks like things are falling apart. But I don't think things are falling apart. I think things are falling right into place. Paul was right where God had him doing exactly what God wanted him to do. So he wasn't having much luck in the temple. But I can imagine Paul walking around Corinth, seeing what he sees, 36 different temples, 36 false gods, the temple to Aphrodite, the sexual immorality, the sailors indulging in, the drunkenness, and walking around and saying, I can't give up. I can't give up. These people have no hope. These people need Jesus. They are lost. They are dying. And I have the solution. And if they're not going to hear it in the synagogues, then you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go start banging on some doors. I'm going to go start knocking on some doors. I'm going to go say, hey, you, you need Jesus. I mean, I'm going to take you with me. And how about you over here? If they're not going to listen, how about you? Can I tell you about the risen Savior? And Paul just went door to door because he had the fire of God shut up in his bones and he could do nothing else except preach the gospel. So we see that Paul needed some friends. He came across some foes. But then in verse seven and eight, it says this. Many are saved, including Crispus, the leader of the Jewish synagogue. So we begin to see the fruit. Had to overcome an obstacle. God provided every step of the way, maybe even redirected the course. And finally, Paul starts to see some fruit. And lastly, we see in 18, 9 through 11, that God himself reassures Paul in a vision. And he says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Keep preaching, for I have many people in this city. So we end with the father's faithfulness. It's the faithfulness of the father. 
He said, Paul, don't give up. I know it was hard in Athens. I know it's a rocky start here in Corinth. But look around. Just because of the way I'm wired, I can't help to think of the, the children that lived in Corinth. You see, they grew up in a place with just every ungodly thing you can think. And to those kids, that was just normal. That was just life. That was just the way that it is. And Paul going, no, 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 no. There's so much more. There's so much more. If you only knew the love of the Father, if you only knew what Jesus did for you, then all of this would pale in comparison to the glory and the majesty of Jesus. It was so in Paul that it had to get out. He had to sell someone. He had to share that faith. He had to rescue just one more soul. I thank God for Paul. Are you thankful that he didn't quit? Could have easily quit. If Paul quit, I wonder where we would be today. It's so easy to just throw in a towel sometimes when times get hard. When maybe we don't see the, the end. Maybe we can't see the clear path. It's easy to throw in a towel and just move on to something else. Paul wasn't going to have it. You know, I think that when I look at Corinth, and I, I don't want to burst our bubbles today here, but I wonder how close America is in its idolatry, in its wickedness, in its evilness. Just like Corinth. Are we living in a world today? Are we living in a country today, in a society or a culture where the world around us is just spinning out of control, such evil, but yet we sit back and we just accept it? It's just the way it is. Just the culture we live in. There's not much I can do about it. Oh, there's a lot we can do about it, folks. So when I read God's word, whether it's studying or it's just in my own private time, my devotion time, I will always ask the Father these two questions. God, who in this passage of scripture do you want me to emulate? Who is it that you want me to be like? If I can look into this story and say, okay, these characteristics of this person, boy, that would be good for me to have in my life. And then the second question I'll ask the Lord is, who is it that you want me to avoid being like? Or what is it that you want me to avoid? So I want you to ask yourself that even in the next moment. In this story, who do you think God wants us to emulate? Who can we be like? Well, if you say anybody else but Paul, I, I don't, I mean, I think that's the right answer, right? I want to be like Paul, even through adversity, even in difficult situations, even through rejection, even when I'm being accused or arrested, that I've got one message, and it's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ crucified because he is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. I want to be like Paul. And then I started to pray and ask the Lord again. I said, okay, well, who in this passage then should I avoid being like? And the Lord spoke to me. And it wasn't Aphrodite. And it wasn't the temple prostitutes. It wasn't even the synagogue leaders who rejected the message. But the Lord said to me today, and I felt him saying, I want you to, to let the people of Northland know. He wants us to avoid being the Corinthians. We don't want to have a Corinthian mindset. When we see the wrongness that's happening, the evil surrounding us in the world today, do we just become complacent? Do we allow maybe coarse humor in where we should be guarding our hearts and our mind against things of the world? 
Are we accepting of culture in a way that's doing more harm to us personally than it is good? Are we just going to sit back and watch our nation go to hell in a hell, hell in a handbasket? Or can we be like Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, surrounded with people, walking in God's provision and making a difference wherever we go? You see, you, all, you folks have an opportunity that only you have. Tomorrow you're going to get up, you're going to go to your workplace. If I go to your workplace tomorrow, I'm probably going to get thrown out or arrested, right? But if you go to your workplace, you're going to get paid for it and you're going to have the opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. You can be a Paul wherever you go. So I'd like you to close your eyes if you would. Maybe bow your heads and I want you to just just think about your, your life for just a moment. Just in light of those two questions, am I emulating the life of Paul? And am I avoiding living the life, life of a Corinthian? And here's what I know, folks. If we were honest with ourselves today, I think a lot of us would say, you know what? I may have just accepted too much culture into my life. I may allow things to slide to the point where I just don't even recognize the sin that's around me. You may not be participating or taking in it, but just kind of complacent to it. So I just want to ask the, the real question this morning. Do you know we're never going to have another Sunday just like today? That's it. You got this one shot. So be real with yourself. If you can identify your life with that of a Corinthian, maybe you're not living that lifestyle, you're not engaging, but you're just complacent to it, accepting of it, just oblivious to what's going on, Maybe you are living that life. Maybe there are some things in your life today that you're going to say, Dan, you know, I know I need to change. I can't continue to live the same way. I can't continue these patterns in my life. They're killing me. If you can identify more with a Corinthian this morning and you want to make a change with every eye closed, no one looking around, I'm not going to embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. If that's you, will you just slip up a hand so I can see you? Say, you know what? I've got some sin issues in my life. Thank you, I see those hands. I've got some sin issues in my life. And today, it needs to change. Today, it needs to change. I see you, bless you, bless you. Don't want to live this way anymore. Don't want to identify as a Corinthian. I want to be a Holy Spirit-filled follower of Jesus, taking the message of the glorious gospel to the world. Will you stand with me? There were several in the room this morning as there were at all the services that said, you know what? I know that I need some change in my life. I've done some things. I can identify that in my life, and I need Jesus. And if that was you today and you raised your hand, then there's going to be a prayer team down here at the end. And we would love to be that friend in your life, to come around you, to, to encourage you, to walk you through this new journey with Jesus. And for the rest of us, don't quit. Keep going. Keep going. Don't be afraid. Keep going because the Lord is with you. Father, I thank you for this time that we've had this morning. I pray blessings over this community of faith. Let Northland be a church that is so filled with the Holy Spirit that wherever we go, people see Jesus before they see us. So we give you thanks. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.